I've seen a sort of spate of YouTube videos recently talking about stillness and the lack of stillness and silence in our lives. And I feel like a lot of the time social media really gets blamed really hard for this sense of a loss of stillness in our lives and uh, a sense of busyness and uh, overwhelm in our lives. But uh, a mini documentary by Matt Diavella on this subject recently pointed out that this is actually kind of a universal human experience that we have been feeling for a very, very long time and long before digital technology uh, came onto the scene. The other day I finished reading a book that I've mentioned here before on the channel. I've been kind of going through a phase of reading about human consciousness and awareness and that kind of thing. And so I picked up a book on psychedelics and their effect on the human mind. Uh, really just out of curiosity and not really knowing what I was going to take from this book or what its main message was going to be. And the main message in the end from this book that I got was quite different to what anything I might have expected. The author Michael Pollan was coming to psychedelics from quite a sceptical point of view. Uh, he wasn't coming to it with a background of spirituality and so his conclusions are very much kind of rooted in a belief that this is all kind of happening in the mind even though he does kind of say that he's open to the possibility that the experiences that people have while on psych psychedelics while taking psych psychedelics uh, could be kind of real in a sort of something being beyond the mind kind of way. Um, but the conclusion he does kind of come to is that psychedelics facilitate a sort of state of mind that he considers to be spiritual or mystical. And for him, essentially, spirituality or mysticism is this experience that psychedelics facilitate. And that is a state of a loss of ego, a state where the mind sort of quietens its sense of self and sense of time and um, expands outwards, essentially. So there is this kind of sense uh, while that is often experienced while, while taking these kinds of drugs that the boundaries of the self are completely broken down and there is a greater sense of connection uh, to the greater world, to the universe and so on. And this can get interpreted and experienced in, in myriad different ways for different people. Of course, this kind of experience, this kind of mystical experience, uh, doesn't only happen while taking psychedelics. It also happens during meditation, during trance work, uh, during ritual, uh, sometimes spontaneously, uh, I find, uh, out in nature. It, it is the kind of experience that humans have been describing for millennia and uh, that certainly can be brought about through lots of different ways. Uh, the reason that I kind of was interested in this book and the reason, uh, the kind of main message that, that Michael Pollan was taking away from it is, is I guess that psychedelics are sort of like a fast track towards that state of mind. But what interested me most about this was that this kind of breakdown of ego, this kind of loss of the sense of self, um, is kind of associated with a quieting of the mind and with finding stillness. And I think those two concepts are definitely my main understandings of what it is to have a spiritual moment, to have a spiritual experience, um, but I'd never before understood how much they really are interlinked. Uh, because uh, the author talked in the book about uh, various different uh, brain scans that had been done and that a certain part of the brain had been essentially discovered that uh, controls or uh, certainly that lights up while the brain is particularly, while the mind is particularly bogged down in kind of ego focused thinking. So this part of the mind or the brain that seems to be responsible for our ego uh, is called uh, the default mode network. So it's kind of understood to be the default mode that the mind, the human mind, will kind of fall into when it's not being distracted, when it's not having other experiences. So essentially, this is what the brain looks like. This is the parts of the brain that light up when we are sitting in a reverie, when we are thinking about ourselves in particular, and um, basically when we are just kind of deep in kind of abstract thought thought and especially when we're kind of thinking about memories and worrying about the future and linking these kind of future hopping moments to our autobiographical narrative. What happens when we are meditating or when we slip into this kind of mystical spiritual state of mind uh, when people take psychedelics is that that part of the mind essentially quietens, uh, that the brain kind of has an opportunity to uh, try out different pathways and to kind of expand beyond that default state. 
and um, there are so many different ways why this is beneficial. The book is largely concerned with how uh, taking psychedelics, um, particularly in the context of uh, kind of psychotherapy uh, and kind of in a kind of carefully controlled uh, environment, uh, can be used to treat uh, mental health disorders, um, specifically things like depression, uh, where the mind has essentially gotten too bogged down into uh, this uh, default state, into this kind of egocentric kind of web, this tangle, and uh, that actually managing to break the brain and the mind out of this pattern um, is enough to kind of allow new neural pathways to kind of ex expand and to make the person feel more connected to everything outside of them, they, they are not so bogged down, they're not so, they're not just stuck in navel gazing essentially. And I find this really interesting because it, 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 like I say, it links together those two parts of spirituality that I think, especially in the alternative spiritual community, in the community of people who consider themselves to be spiritual and not religious, I think that is what we kind of understand spirituality to be. It is a state of being or um, uh, maybe a kind of set of values that consider those beyond us and those outside of us, that consider our connection to the outer world and to other people, and potentially to a spiritual realm of some kind, and um, often connecting to a kind of greater consciousness, a universal consciousness, that can very much be a sense that comes along with spirituality, and also with a, a sense of, of stillness and calm, um, a feeling of kind of reflection, and um, a sense that we are just tapping into something uh, that is innate within us. And again, that sense of kind of universal consciousness maybe uh, links these two, these two parts of spirituality, the sense of, of it being kind of uh, transcending the ego and also uh, finding stillness and finding this kind of unique state of consciousness or awareness within us that we normally don't access, that we normally go around in our day-to-day -day lives very much kind of locked in our own minds and, and thinking all these this kind of chattery thoughts and um, a lot of us experience when we start meditating or when we have a kind of uh, mystical experience, a lot of us experience this sense that there is another form of consciousness underlying that kind of monkey mind, underlying all of that chatter, underlying that ego. We kind of have this experience of, oh, even if I manage to let go of all of that, if I am in a state where I am able to let go of the ego, to let go of this kind of autobiographical narrative, to let go of all that chatter that's going on in my mind, there is still something there underneath. There is something that is aware and conscious underneath that. And um, that, yeah, essentially seems to be what people describe to be uh, the mystical experience. So when people talk about needing to find stillness, when people talk about how much their time on social media is detrimental to their mental health, to their sense of well-being, to their happiness, when people talk about wanting to get away from screens and to start living life, um, my understanding now, having read this book, is that what they are looking for is to quieten their default mode network. It is to expand their minds uh, into just uh, experiences and uh, mental states that they are maybe not often in uh, because of this constant uh, constant desire for distraction and to keep that ego ticking over because uh, we kind of, we manage to survive life largely through our ego. Our ego is very helpful to us. Um, it is very concerned with our own individual well-being and, uh, but on a very kind of basic level, on a very sort of managing to stay alive and keep us safe kind of level. So it makes sense that we are very easily drawn into things that are going to exercise and excite that default mode network. Um, that you know, things that are going to just keep keep that kind of sense of this is me, uh, this is me in, and myself in this kind of narrative of, of my life, Th these are the ways that I'm connected to other people and to keep us kind of introspective, to keep us kind of locked in our own minds. Um, I would be interested to learn more about um, how we distract ourselves with entertainment and so on and how that links to the default mode network because I feel like those two things are very definitely linked. I feel like although we in some ways switch our minds off uh, in terms of, of introspection when we are kind of watching entertainment, when we are watching TV, when we are scrolling on our phones, at the same time I feel like the reward that we are receiving, uh, the kind of mental reward that we are receiving through those forms of entertainment seems to be very caught up in the ego and in that kind of state of mind. Um, and so what I think people are looking for is a sense of uh, a loss of ego. They're looking to 
break out of that. Um, they're looking essentially for a spiritual or mystical experience without necessarily knowing that that's what they're looking for. Um, and I think everyone has those experiences, they interpret them in different ways, you know, one person might just feel like this is their quiet time, they might discover that they have a way of accessing that sense of stillness and peace and connectivity and expansion, and, but they might not think of it as being spiritual. So I would hesitate to use the word spiritual to describe it, you know, as a whole, as a mental state, um, because I think everyone has their own understandings of, of what that mental state is, and everyone has their own understandings of what spirituality is, um, but I definitely think there's a, a strong correlation between the two things. and. I, it definitely seems as though um, throughout our existence that humans have struggled and searched for and s kind of been striving for that state of mind, that kind of spiritual, mystical state of mind, and that it is kind of a part and parcel of the human struggle. And, you know, as far back as the Buddha, we have been searching for methods to enable us to break out of that. Thinking in this way about meditation has actually been really helpful to me because I feel like in the past, when I've been meditating, I have felt a bit like if I feel like physio physiologically that I'm not becoming calm and still, that I'm somehow doing it wrong. Like often, especially in the evenings, I find that my anxiety tends to flare up a little bit. I will have more, more often will have anxiety symptoms in the evenings. And even if there's nothing kind of really happening in my mind, it, I will still have sort of like the you know, racing heart and just a sense of ag agitation. And sometimes I sit to meditate and I find that um, I, even though I'm managing to get myself into a fairly still state of mind, that my heart is still kind of pounding and I'm still feeling a little bit kind of not exactly relaxed. Um, and I have found it actually very helpful to just remind myself that that's not really what I'm aiming for. Um, that man managing to calm my body physiologically is a nice added bonus to meditating. If it happens, quite often it will help kind of later down the line, like maybe an hour later I'll realise that I am feeling more calm physiologically. But it's kind of a reminder to me that what I'm looking for is uh, a sense of stillness in my mind, but most importantly, a moving away from my sense of self. A moving away from this kind of locked in sense of ego, from worrying about myself and my relation to other people and the things that I need to get done and what I did yesterday and what I need to do tomorrow. That's kind of the main focus of what I'm trying to move away from. I'm trying to just allow my mind to expand into something slightly different. And that might sound very kind of prosaic, but to my mind, I do believe that there is something spiritual, that there is something a bit more to this kind of spiritual mystical experience than just a certain part of our brain quietening. Um, I do hold a belief that we are tapping into something. I'm not quite sure what, but uh, having experienced it myself on numerous occasions, uh, I do have a kind of belief in, in universal consciousness. And um, I feel when I'm in, in that experience that something is happening that can't be fully explained just by my brain chemistry. Um, so it might sound like a very prosaic way of, of thinking about meditation, like, oh, I'm just trying to essentially worry less and think less about myself but it allows me to slip into that mental state. It allows my brain to soften a bit and to kind of move towards an expansion of consciousness and to find uh, that space where I can sense divinity, essentially. Um, and everybody has their own thing that they're maybe wanting to do with meditation. Every meditator is different and um, that might not be your aim, but that is kind of my aim. But I think if I'm sitting to, down to meditate and I'm thinking I want to sense the divine, that's too big. Like that's too much to be looking at every day when you're sitting down to meditate, I think. It's, it's, it's a very lofty goal. So instead I try and focus now on just saying to myself, okay, I'm just gonna release all of this. I'm gonna release all of this ego tension, all of the worries and all of the just the, the little story storylines and narratives that I have in my mind uh, that relate me to other people and, and everything that's going on. I try to just loosen that and let go of it and just remind myself of the vastness of the cosmos that I'm part of and just ease my mind out into that. Meditation is definitely not the only way to do this. Um, I think that the most organic way that I can find this state of mind is being out in nature, is going for walks, is um, seeing breathtaking views, is accomplishing something physically, climbing to the top of a mountain and looking out over uh, the views and, and seeing um, a perspective on 
the part of the world that I live in that I haven't maybe seen before. Um, that kind of experience for me is is really vital to keeping this memory of what it feels like to be in that state of mind, um, to not be caught up <laughs> in in myself. And I think I think being out in nature, especially when we see broad sweeping views, I think that helps because it's a very obvious physical reminder of how small we are really in the scope of things, not in a negative way necessarily, but in a way that reminds us to just break free of that mental chatter, of that cage that we can find ourselves in, and just remind us how huge and vast the world really is and how we can so easily be a part of that, that we can allow ourselves to experience ourselves as, as something much bigger. I think sometimes in order to feel vast, we need to actually first feel very small. We need to realise how small our physical body really is in order to remember how much our mind can actually transcend that and how much when we are experiencing this huge vast world outside of us, we can let go of the stack of bills that we're worrying about. We can let go of that little argument that we had with our partner or our friend and we can let go of our worries about work, what we have to do in work tomorrow um, and about our children and about all of these things that are important but at the same time that sometimes we need to be able to let go of. We need to be able to just release. So in terms of distractions I don't necessarily categorize social media and other forms of entertainment in the same box with when it comes to this kind of thing. I think for me there are certain types, there are certain forms of television, certain forms of entertainment that do cage me more, that do make me feel a bit more bogged down and, and closed in. But a lot of the time the kind of television shows I enjoy watching, the movies I enjoy watching, I feel like they expand me. Um, they remind me that there are other experiences out there in the world that people are having right now that are different to mine and um, I actually find that to be helpful. On the other hand, social media is pretty much tailor-made to just stroke the ego and to strengthen the ego and that is exactly what it is. It is you just creating a profile, creating a platform to stand on and say, this is me, this is my ego, look how prettily I have constructed it. Um, so I definitely think going forward, I, I want to maybe think a bit more um, about the distinction between how when I'm using any of my screened devices, um, how much time I'm spending on social media versus how much time I'm spending consciously uh, with entertainment that actually is a maybe a more healthy way for me to unwind. I'm sure books are great, but I, I love cinema. I actually enjoy, really enjoy watching a really good TV show. Um, I, that's not something I, I want to let go of. And I don't think it has to be something negative. I think people can get too bogged down in, in just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and if there is something that you really gain posit something positive from then by all means keep that in your life. I'm also not saying that social media is all bad, I think it allows us to reach out and connect to other people and if we're able to focus on that more than focusing on how we are putting ourselves out there um, then that's probably a positive thing too. It can be very very uh, inspirational uh, to follow other people on social media and it can really again expand our sense of our consciousness, expand us out you know towards other people and that can be great but um, I think it's definitely a slippery slope. So that's where my thoughts have been at this week and those are the ideas that reading that book has inspired in me and this hasn't been exactly a review which is kind of what I said I would do but um, I prefer making these kinds of videos to kind of straightforward book reviews and I think I'll probably continue to talk about books like this on the channel and just kind of try and pick an idea uh, that has really spoken to me from a book that I've read and expand on it and talk about it in relation to other things that have been coming up in my life recently. So let me know what you think about that and um, let me know your thoughts on this topic. And um, I hope that maybe some of these ideas have been helpful for you, especially with regards to meditation. Sometimes just finding a little trick with what it is that you're aiming for with meditation can be just so helpful. It can really make the difference between sitting there feeling like you're just wasting time and sitting there feeling like you really are accomplishing something and you are taking a moment in the day to do something very different for yourself in terms of your self-care uh, than anything else that you can possibly do for yourself in that day. So thanks for watching as always. I hope you're all doing really well and I will talk to you again soon.